on last week, we began our unit on informational text. You know, when I think about it, when I was a little kid, I read a lot for entertainment. But I found myself reading more informational text over the years. It could be as something as simple as deciding what to buy. Perhaps I may make a connection to something I see on TV or even thoughts that I've always pondered over. Either way, reading is the gateway to acquiring new knowledge. An informational text is a nonfiction text that gives details about a topic. Authors often organize ideas with captions and subtitles to tell readers what each section of the text is about. After each title, authors can organize the text according to core ideas, and support them with key ideas. So again, after each title, authors can organize text according to core ideas and support them with key ideas, such as data, definitions, or examples. Authors can also organize ideas by explaining cause and effect, problem and solution, or by comparing and contrasting information. Informational text includes text features which hold prints, italics, all caps, keywords and captions, and all sorts of visual elements, such as charts and diagrams. It's always important for readers to take note of these key features while reading. I find myself telling students each year that yes, text is important, but when it comes to informational text, so is the text feature. Uh, so are text features. I like to look at the written text and the text features as a married couple. How many do we need to have a couple? Two, right? Those features support our understanding of the text as well as the words. They too support our understanding of the text. And when it comes to informational text, one needs both. Today, we will explore some of the many, many text features in detail. Scholars, we will also recognize and explain characteristics of text structures of informational text, including the central idea with supporting text evidence, graphic features, and those organizational patterns. Likewise, we will analyze and explain how the author's use of such characteristics and text structure achieves specific purposes. After analyzing these author's craft techniques, we will be able to truly own informational text. Now, before we get started, Let's jump into our learning goals. Today, we will recognize characteristics and structures of informational text. Again, we will recognize characteristics and structures of informational text, including organizational patterns, such as logical order and order of importance. 
In addition to that, we will recognize characteristics and structures of informational text. Recognize characteristics and structures of informational text, including the central idea with supporting evidence, including the central idea with supporting evidence. Last week, we spent quite a few minutes on the text structures. Remember, a pattern is something that repeats. So when it comes to informational text, we say that there's an organizational pattern of how the text is organized. We see this pattern showing up over and over again. And we call these our nonfiction text structures. I created this diagram and hopefully it would help you gain a better understanding. Descriptive. Remember, with a descriptive text structure, the author would include a central idea or a main topic, and then we'll have supporting details to support the main topic. That is descriptive. Problem and solution. This is when authors pose a problem, look at the problem, and we put these pieces of the puzzle together in a solution. The author poses a problem and a solution. When this is the case, we call it a problem and solution text structure. Now, how about cause and effect? Cause and effect. Cause and effect is when an author demonstrates something that happens and a result of why it happens. When we see something that happens and why, we call that a cause and effect text structure. Compare and contrast. Compare and contrast. How things are alike and how they are different. Compare and contrast text structure. And sequential. Sequential. Sequential is when authors demonstrate steps in a process. This happened first, and then this happened next, and finally this happened. When we see informational text written in a way that there is a sequence of events or steps, that is considered sequential order. Sequential. And for the last one, chronological. Chronological order is text that follows a sequence, but unlike sequential order, chronological order shows events using time. The time could be days, it could be months, it could be minutes, but if time is involved, it could even be month. in the morning I woke up, in the afternoon I decided to go to work, in the evening I came home. That would be chronological order. Again, chronological order, yes, it follows a sequence, but it involves time as well. Before our lesson today, I created several charts to help us better understand and break down those text features. Remember, we could take one topic and one passage or one text, one book, one article, one piece of information can have multiple text features. Let's take a look at some of the text features one may find while reading.
So for today's text features, I decided to use the topic of balloons because when I'm not teaching, I'm generally working with balloons among other things. So today, I thought I'd share a little knowledge about balloons as well as text features. And this way, we can stick to one topic. So the first text feature is title. Title. Believe it or not, every book has a title. The title is a text feature, and we shouldn't ignore the title. What is the purpose of the title? It identifies the topic of the text, tells what the text is about. So for our example today, if we were to read an informational text about balloons, balloons could be a possible title. Another text feature is the title page. The title page. Sometimes kids just skip the title page. Don't skip the title page. The title page tells a book's title, author, illustrator, and publisher. You usually flip the page. I'm sorry, flip the cover of the book and you will see a title page before the author goes into the story. So the name of our book, our pretend book, is Balloons by Vanetta Dupree, illustrated by Marley Milan, and it's from the Sydney Publishing Company. This would be on the title page. How about the table of contents? The table of contents is so important because it tells the names of the chapters and what page the chapters can be found. The table of contents tells the names of the chapters and what page the chapters can be found. So look at my table of contents. This book has at least 37 pages, but if I were doing research, let's say on balloon inflators, I wouldn't have to read everything. I could use my table of contents. Quick search is typically in order. Chapter one, introduction. Chapter two, history of balloons. Chapter three, latex. Chapter four, balloon artists 101. Chapter five, air versus helium. Chapter six, inflators. Bingo, I'm here. So I can basically Flip through the book and turn to page 15, and chapter 6 is where I will find information about inflators. And by the way, while reading the information about the inflators, guess what? I could easily go to the glossary if I see a word that is unfamiliar, perhaps is in the glossary, or suppose I wanted to find out more about something in particular, I could probably go to the index, which is found in the back of the book. Here's another one. Heading. The heading divides the text into sections and explains what the section will be about. The heading. So as we can see here, the heading, we have two. Helium field arch and air field arch. Say I wanted to find out about it airfield arch versus a helium field arch. Airfield arch. An airfield arch is less expensive than helium and must be tied or attached to a structure. So again, this heading helps me because it tells me all about airfield arch arches. Headings divides the text into sections and explains what the section will be about. How about the index? We just mentioned it briefly. Tells what pages the reader can find certain topics. The index tells what pages the reader can find certain topics. Look at this index. The index is in alphabetical order. Suppose I wanted to find out about hmm, balloon columns. 
A to C, page seven. And bullet points. I love using bullet points when I write in note taking. Organizational tool that makes listed items easier to read and understand. So as you can see, I have bullet points right here. This section is about decor and look at the bullet points. Different types of decor, organic, classic, or other bullet points. A graph organizes and helps compare information in a visual way. How about labels? Label. Labels tell the names of certain parts of a photograph or illustration. Labels tell, scratch off the S, labels tell the names of certain parts of a photograph or illustration. So I can take this one from a fall literacy night we had at school. And suppose I wanted to label parts of this balloon arch. Okay. Arrow. This was the frame. And under the table is the base. So these are labels because labels tell names of certain parts of a photograph or illustration. Before we jump into our story, we have academic vocabulary that is critical to understanding the story. Make connections. Make connections when we make connections, we find ways the text relates to you, other texts you've read, or the world around you. Make connections. Summarize. Summarize. Re-express the most important information or the main ideas of a text in your own words. Summarize. Summary, short paraphrased version of a text that includes the central idea, summary. We always talk about the summary and remember when it comes to informational text, one must summarize each section or each paragraph in order to understand the author's main message and the author's purpose. Supporting evidence. These two go hand in hand. We have central idea and supporting evidence. Central idea and supporting evidence. The central idea, the topic, the text that is mainly about. The main idea that readers should find when reading a text. And the central idea, details, facts, or ideas that support or say more about the central idea. Order of importance, order of importance. Organizational pattern used by the author to present ideas or information moving from the most relevant or most important to the least relevant or least important or less important or vice versa. Now, here are some thinking stems that you may see, or in other words, this is how we respond to text. Here are questions that we might ask ourselves when reading informational text. What are paragraphs blank and blank about? What are paragraphs blank and blank about? Which information is best supported by information throughout the chapter? Which information is best supported by information throughout the chapter? Based on the information found in paragraph blank, why does blank? The author wrote this selection most likely to 
The author wrote this selection most likely to. And which idea from the selection is illustrated by the photograph? Today's story, I'm sorry, today's text is called Faber's Book of Insects. The story was written by, I keep saying story. Today's Today's text is called Faber's Book of Insects. It was written by Rodolph Staywell and illustrated by E.J. Detmold. Now, we talked about some of the text features today. Title page, here's the title page. And this book has over 200 pages. And of course we don't have time to read all 250 something to 300 pages. So in order to research or ascertain the information we need for today, what text feature do we need? If you said table of contents, you were correct. And here is the table of contents. Today, we're going to focus on chapter six, the praying mantis. Chapter six, the praying mantis. There is an insect of the South that is quite as interesting as the cicada, but much less famous because it makes no noise. Had it been provided with symbols, its renown would have been greater than the celebrated musicians, for it is most unusual both in shape and habits. In ancient Greece, this insect was named Mantis, or the prophet. They believed that a pe peasant saw her on the sun-scorched grass standing half erect in a very imposing and majestic manner. With her, with her broad green gossamer wings trailing like long veins and her forelegs like arms raised to the sky as though in prayer. To the peasant's ignorance, the insect seemed like a priestess or a nun, and so she came to be called the praying mantis. So, which idea is best supported by the first paragraph of the text? Although one may think it's a story, it's not a story. If you go back and think about what was read, the author mentioned that this is what the Greeks believe. The Greeks believe that the insect was in a praying position, which is why they called it the praying mantis. So what can we infer? We can infer that the praying mantis got its name from how the praying mantis positioned its hands. So what can we infer? We can infer that the praying mantis got its name from how the praying mantis positioned its forelegs like arms raised to the sky. Now we know why it's called the praying mantis. That was never a greater mistake. Those pious airs of fraud, those arms raised in prayer are really the most horrible weapons which slay whatever passes within reach. The mantis is fierce as a tigress, cruel as ogress. She feeds only on living creatures. There is nothing in her appearance to inspire dread. She is not without a certain beauty with her slender graceful figure, 
her pale green coloring and her long gauze wings. Having a flexible neck, she can move her head freely in all directions. She is the only insect that can direct her gaze whenever she will. Great is the contrast between this peaceful looking body and the murderous machinery of the four legs. The hunch is very long and powerful, while the thigh is even longer and carries on its lower surface, two rows of sharp spikes or teeth. Behind these teeth are three spurs. In short, the thigh is a saw with two blades between which the leg lies when folded back. Now let's think about the author's use of compare and contrast in these two paragraphs. In the first paragraph, the author talks about how the praying mantis is known for having certain beauty and a graceful figure. But in the second, the author mentions how it's powerful, but the hunch is very long and powerful. It's lower surface, two rows of sharp spikes or teeth. It is impossible to make a complete study of the habits of the mantis in the open fields, so I am obliged to take her indoors. A mantis can live quite happily in a pan filled with sand and covered with a gauge dish cover, if only it be supplied with plenty of fresh food. In order to find out what can be done by the strength and daring of the mantis, one must provide it not only with locusts and grasshoppers, but also with the largest spiders of the neighborhood. So let's look at the first sentence. We talked about central idea. And students, it is very important when you're reading informational text, always read that first sentence, focus on that first sentence, and then everything after the first sentence of a paragraph usually consists of the supporting details. It is impossible to make a complete study of the habits of the mantis in the open fields. So the author talks about how it's impossible to completely study the habits of a mantis. After that, she explains why. She can live in different areas. Let's continue reading. A gray locust, heedless of danger, walks toward the mantis. The latter gives a compulsive shiver and suddenly, in the most surprising way, strikes an attitude that fills the locust with terror and is quite enough to startle anyone. The wing covers. Open, the wings spread to their full extent and stand erect like cells, towering over the insect's back. The author goes on to talk about how the praying mantis acts differently with the spider. We can analyze the compare and contrast text structure by seeing how a praying mantis responds the same and how the praying mantis responds differently to the different insects. And also important to know that while we see evidence of compare and contrast, there's also evidence of descriptive text structures. Here's an example. Here's one example. 
After all, however, the mattress has her good points. Remember, with informational text, we may see multiple text structures and one, even on one page. We just read an example, or we just discussed an example of a compare and contrast text structure that is found in the text. But listen to this one. The nest is to be found more or less anywhere in sunny places. The praying mantis makes the most marvelous nest. This nest is to be found more or less everywhere in sunny places on stones, wood, vine stalks, twigs, or dry grass, and even on such things as bits of brick, strips of linen, or the shriveled leather of an old boot. Any support will serve as long as there is an uneven surface to form a solid foundation. So let's think about that. The author describes the nest and where it could be found. What type of text structure is that? If you said descriptive, you write Now, let's look at another passage. It is a remarkable fact that the mother mantis builds these cleverly made nests while she is actually laying her eggs. From her body, she produces a sticky substance rather like the caterpillar's sick fluid. Now, let's look at another example. It is a remarkable fact that the mother mantis builds this cleverly made nest while she is actually laying her eggs. From her body, she produces a sticky substance, rather like the caterpillar silk fluid, and this material she mixes with the air and whips into froth. She beats it into a foam with two ladles that she has at the tip of her body just as we beat white of egg with the fork. The foam is grayish white, almost like soap suds, and when it first appears, it is sticky, but soon after, it has solidified. In this sea of foam, the mantis deposits her eggs. Each layer of eggs is laid, it is covered with froth, which quickly becomes solid. In a new nest, the belt of exit doors is coated with a material that seems different from the rest. A layer of fine porous matter of a pure, dull, almost chalky white, which contrasts with the dirty white of the remainder of the nest. It is like the mixture of the confectioner's Make a whip of white eggs, sugar, and starch with which to ornament their cakes. When it is gone, the exit belt is clearly visible with its two rows of plates. The wind and rain sooner or later remove it in strips of flakes, and therefore the old nest shows no trace of it. Doesn't that have a different feel? Think about the different text structures that we've learned. In this case, what text structure do you think the author organized this latest passage or this latest section? If you said sequential, then you're right. The author uses the sequential text structure to demonstrate or explain how the nest is made by the praying mantis. Now, here's your exit ticket for today.
I want you to write your own informational text. If you have time, read about the praying mantis. You can even watch a video, video of the praying mantis in action. How cool would that be? But write your own informational text about any topic, perhaps another insect. Be sure to include text features and discuss your organizational pattern used. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. Remember to always, 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 always read like a writer.